Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So the case that I have for you guys today is one that I genuinely don't know what to think. I do have my theory of what I think is most likely, but you guys always have so many good theories and thoughts that I didn't even consider. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what your guys' thoughts are about this case. This is a case that I don't think has been talked about enough and unfortunately, there aren't a lot of articles out there and there hasn't been movement in this case in the recent years. So I wanna put her case back out there, her picture back out there and hope that the right person will hear her story and come forward with some information that can be helpful towards this investigation. I also want to mention though that this is a Canadian case and a lot of the sources are in French. So I had to do a lot of Google translating and we know that that's not always the perfect translation. So if anything I state in this video is a little bit off, I do apologize. I tried my best to read the English articles and then compare them to the French one since she did go missing in a French-speaking area of Canada. I almost feel like the French articles are probably more accurate since they're closer to where she actually went missing. So I wanted to make sure that I didn't miss any information that I could from not reading the French articles. But again, if you know something that I missed, please let me know down below. Also, there are a lot of words that I have absolutely no clue how to say. I looked them up and I practiced them, but if I do butcher them, feel free to make fun of me in the comments, but just try not to be too harsh. I did try my best. Sometimes I even have trouble with English words, let alone a language that I'm not familiar with. So again, if I do pronounce something incorrectly, I apologize. But before we get into the video, I just wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Bright Sellers. Bright Sellers is a wine subscription company founded by two MIT graduates who wanted to help people find wine that they love. You go onto their website and take a quiz that takes less than 30 seconds and their algorithm will match you with wines that you are guaranteed to like based on your taste profile. Each wine comes with super cute educational cards that gives you a serving and pairing tips. This is great for people who love trying new wines but don't really know enough about them to know what you're gonna like. I know that when I go to a restaurant that has a big list of wines, I'll ask one of my friends, which one do you think I will like? Because they know a lot more what all of these different wine terms mean than I do. So a lot of times I always end up getting the same exact thing, which just gets so boring. But now I can have my wines handpicked out just for me based on what I like. So I like wine that's sweet and light. So Bright Cellar sent me two rosés and two whites. They all have fruity tastes to them, which is my absolute favorite. This one is probably my favorite, as you can tell. It has flavors of strawberry, cranberry, and lemon with hints of floral rose petal aroma. I always thought that I just liked white Rieslings, but now I have a newfound love for rosés. Another cool thing about Bright Cellars is that the more you rate and give feedback about your wines, the better matches that you will get. But if for some reason you don't love a bottle in your shipment, Bright Cellars will send you a replacement in your next box. And I'm all about sustainable packaging. Bright Cellars ships their wine in totally sustainable, recyclable, plastic-free, and small footprint packaging. The exciting news is that by clicking the link down below, my subscribers can get 60% off of their first four-bottle box, which brings you to $38 for four wines. That is such a great deal, and it makes it so easy to just have some wine on hand for your next girls' night or for your next movie night. So again, make sure you go ahead and click the link down below and get 60% off of your first four-bottle box. Thank you again to Bright Sellers for sponsoring today's video. With all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the unsolved disappearance of Marilyn Bergeon. Marilyn Bergeon was born December 21st, 1983 in Chicoutimi, Quebec, Canada, but moved to Quebec City in the borough of Hot St. Charles in 1998. She has a big sister named Nathalie and her parents are Michael Bergeon and Andre Bouchard. Her parents described Marilyn as an open girl who sees the best in others and is very interested about learning about different cultures. She absolutely loves music and art and has been taking art lessons since she was 10 years old. In high school, she involved herself in as many extracurriculars as she could to become a better musician and was always trying to start a band with her being the guitarist. Now, French was her native language, but she also speaked English and she spoke it just as fluently as she spoke French. She had also started learning how to speak Spanish and shortly before her disappearance, 
since she had started learning how to speak Russian. Now, because of where her interests lied in the music scene, Marilyn surrounded herself with people of similar interests. She hung out with a lot of musicians and stereotypically, musicians tend to be very outgoing and interesting people. Marilyn herself was adventurous and she wanted to get out there and experience life, so she did get into some minor trouble when she was a teenager. Her parents found out that when she was a teenager, she was hanging around people who were doing drugs and people who may not have been the best influences on her. But her parents knew that she was just a teenager. She was really smart and gifted and a talented kid who didn't get into more trouble than the average teen. So her parents weren't too concerned and let her hang out with pretty much whoever she wanted and let her get past this little rebellious stage in her life. Now, after high school, she went to college and earned a degree in media arts and technology. But after living most of her life in Quebec City, Marilyn became bored by just being in the same place all the time. She wanted to move to a new city that offered a plethora of new experiences. So by 2005, Marilyn moved from her home city in Quebec City and moved to Montreal, Canada into her own apartment. When she was there, she got a job at Steve's Music and Art, which seemed like the perfect fit for her since she was so into music and art. But as you can pretty much expect, this job wasn't very well paying, so she did end up taking on some freelance jobs at a TV station as an audio editor. But even as she was doing this, she still wanted to live out her dreams of traveling the world and experiencing new things. She had dreams of one day moving to Vancouver and becoming a flight attendant. But for the time being, she just needed to focus on herself, focus on working, and save a little bit of money. Things seemed great for Marilyn for quite a while. She was working, making friends. She was living in this amazing new city and was just overall working towards all of her goals and aspirations. However, near the end of 2007 going into early 2008, those around Marilyn noticed a little bit of a shift in her behavior. They noticed that she had started acting a little bit more depressed, withdrawn, and just overall down. After moving to Montreal, she had reconnected with an old friend named Jonathan who she had known from college and hadn't spoken to in a couple of years. But the two had known each other for quite a long time and they found each other on Facebook, so they decided to see each other again. The two had plans to go to this party together in December of 2007. He met her at her apartment before going, but once he got to her place, he said that she was just sort of acting depressed and was sitting alone in the dark, just listening to some sad music. This really struck him as odd because he had always known her as being incredibly happy and bubbly. But after the two hung out at her place for a little bit, she did get into a better mood and the two did end up going to the party. Once they got there, she seemed to be her normal, happy, outgoing, and bubbly self at first. She was excited to see all of these people that she knew, so she started chatting up with one of her old friends. However, as the two were talking, she immediately got very anxious and upset and she wanted to go home which they did. Jonathan said that as they were talking, it looked like she suddenly just remembered something horrible. He said that immediately after that happened, she absolutely begged him to go home. And like I said, they did, but it wasn't just like a normal, like, hey, can we go home? She was begging him to leave immediately. When they got back to her apartment, it was obvious that Marilyn was incredibly upset and she was just getting worse and worse, but she wouldn't tell Jonathan what happened or why she was so upset. She was just sitting there crying for hours and hours and just wouldn't give up any information. He asked her if she had been raped or sexually assaulted and she said, no, it's worse. And then he asked her if she had witnessed a murder or something like that. And she said, no, it's worse. You can't even imagine what happened. He really could not figure out why she was just so against telling him what happened, but he tried for three or four hours just to get her to tell him what was wrong, but she wouldn't. He thought that maybe she wouldn't say anything to try and protect him, to keep him out of danger. That's sort of the impression that he got from all of this. Then in early 2008, Marilyn started telling her family that she didn't feel safe in Montreal anymore and she wanted to move back home to Quebec City. She had been calling her parents almost every day for about a month, telling them that she just wanted to move back home. On February 10th, 2008, she had a phone call with her mother telling her that she was really scared, so she started packing up her Montreal apartment and started to head back home to the family home in Quebec City. She left without saying goodbye to any 
any of her friends or co-workers. She just headed straight home. Over the course of that following week, her and her family went back and forth, bringing all of her belongings from Montreal to the family home. On February 15th, they made their last trip to Montreal to gather the rest of her belongings. That evening, she did spend with some friends. Then by February 16th, they moved all of the rest of her belongings to the family home in Quebec City, and she was officially moved in. And of course, when she got home, her family was able to tell that she just was not in the best headspace. Now, her sister Nathalie was in California at the time that she came back home. She didn't get to see her like she wanted to, but the two stayed in contact and talked on the phone regularly. The first week that Marilyn was home, she was speaking on the phone with Nathalie and she said, is there light at the end of this tunnel? And she told her sister that she never wanted to return to Montreal ever again. But once again, when Nathalie asked her why, she wouldn't tell her. She would just start crying. Nathalie said that she seemed like she was very depressed and she was really worried about her. She was not acting anything like her normal self. Her parents also tried figuring out what happened. They asked her if her not being safe in Montreal was related to heartache, like a breakup, or if it was drugs or debt. And every time they asked her, she would say no. But there was one instance where Marilyn's mom described asking her if she had been assaulted and Marilyn just sort of tightened her lips, looked down, and she started crying uncontrollably. Her mom said that she knew immediately that she had most likely been very, very hurt by somebody, and she knew that this was something that was very, very difficult to talk about, and she told her daughter that she didn't want her to go through this alone. Because of this, her mother suggested that she go see a psychologist, and Marilyn agreed. Now, the next morning on February 17th, 2008, 24-year-old Marilyn woke up, she ate some breakfast and told her parents that she was leaving the house to go on a walk and walk around the neighborhood and said that she would be back in a couple of hours. She left at 11.15 a.m. and at this time, she was wearing her long black coat with a gray faux fur trim and her black suede boots. It was really cold outside at that time, as you can imagine, for February in Canada, so she was dressed for the weather but the only thing she brought with her was her credit card. She didn't bring her ID or any other form of payments. Shortly after leaving, Marilyn was seen at an ATM at the Casse Popularized Bank on Boulevard de la Mer in La Tetteville. I'm so sorry if I said that wrong. She tried to withdraw $60 from her account, but her card was denied. Now, in the video, it said that she appeared nervous and she was looking around while making this transaction. As we watch the video, we can see that she looks to the left and then back at the machine and then looked left again before the video ends. Her eyes do look a little bit worried to me. I also want to note that in this video, we can see Marilyn holding a small black backpack. This was strange because her parents don't remember seeing her carrying this when she left the house that day. It's thought that maybe she was hiding this backpack somewhere and picked it up somewhere along the way. Or maybe she had met up with someone who gave her this black backpack at some point after she left. Then she wasn't seen again for another five hours until 4.30 p.m. At this time, she bought a cup of coffee at the Cafe Depot in St. Romuald, which is around 12 miles or 20 kilometers south of her parents' house. Now, Marilyn did not own her own car, so it's not known whether she walked there, got a cab there, or got a ride for someone she knew, or if she had hitched a ride there. Either way, she paid for her coffee with her credit card, and according to the barista who remembered seeing her there, she did look a bit anxious and depressed, and she seemed like she was in a big hurry to leave. However, after this, there are no more confirmed sightings of Marilyn Bergeon. And to this day, her family has absolutely no idea what happened to her. Now, when that evening rolled around and Marilyn had not returned home, her parents immediately knew that something was wrong. So, that very same day, on February 17th, 2008, her family reported her missing to the Quebec City Police. Now, police actually responded pretty quickly, especially given that they knew about Marilyn's behavior and her mood before she left. So, they were immediately able to track down her last known locations using her credit card information. So, it was at this point that her family learned about her going to the ATM and then the coffee shop. Police also set out and started their search efforts to locate 
Marilyn. They looked all up and down the city. They started printing out and handing out flyers with her picture on it, as well as information about her last known whereabouts. Her family was doing everything that they could to help in the searches and put her story out there and her face out there. And immediately, police put out a $10,000 reward on any information leading to her safe return. Now, initially, police did not show Marilyn's parents the video of the ATM. They thought that it was going to be a little bit too upsetting for them to see. However, once they did let her parents see it and they saw it for themselves, they said that to them, she looked helpless in this video. Then they released this footage to the public around a year after her disappearance to see if anyone saw her or knew anything and could come forward with any answers. But as far as I know, nothing really came of that. As police were doing their searches, Marilyn's parents had reached out to all of her friends and acquaintances to see if she was with any of them, but no one had seen her at all. No one claimed to have been with her at that time or even recently before she disappeared. Then nothing happened in the case for two years. Police and the family continued their searches. They continued reaching out to the public and continued spreading information about Marilyn's case. But for the entirety of the investigation, police were going off of the theory that Marilyn had died by suicide. The more they investigated, the more they learned about her poor mental status and her concerning behaviors. An investigative journalist, Claude Poirier, featured Marilyn's case on an episode of Historia. In this episode, he featured the ATM footage and said that he believed that it's possible that she was looking back at a car that was parked on the street. He says that a car could have easily been seen from the angle that she was standing at at the ATM and the way she was looking. But nothing came of this until January of 2010. A man from Hawkesbury, Ontario contacted Poirier to let him know that he had seen Marilyn several times over the course of the past year. Now, Hawkesbury is quite a distance from Quebec City. It's actually around 345 kilometers or a three hour and 40 minute drive south of Quebec City and the entire time you are driving along the St. Lawrence River. But the majority of people who live there do speak French, so she would fit right in. This man claimed to have seen Marilyn regularly around town for at least 11 months, and he claimed that she was always with a man who appeared much younger than her. He believed that she had been living there and had moved around to a bunch of different locations throughout the city several times, but each time she was always with the same young man. He said that he couldn't pinpoint exactly where she was living, but it's a relatively small town, so people who lived there can spot newcomers right away. He said that he saw Marilyn and this very young man going around to all of the local shops and restaurants all of the time. This man was absolutely confident that the woman he saw was Marilyn. So, of course, Marilyn's parents went down there to investigate further. They brought her picture to a couple of local restaurants, and there were a few regular customers at a certain restaurant in downtown town who said that they had seen her there with the young man. By the time they left Hawkesbury, over 30 people had confirmed that they had seen Marilyn. So her parents got into contact with local journalists and police who wrote an article in their newspaper about Marilyn and posted a photo of her. Police promised that they would be vigilant and that they would keep an eye out for Marilyn. The sightings of her in Hawkesbury gave her parents a lot of hope, but they weren't sure why she would be there in the first place. They didn't know any friends or acquaintances that she would know out there. But either way, after this lead, the investigation hit a standstill once again. Police didn't really know where to go with this lead, so nothing really came of it, and the family was just left without answers once again. This continued for another decade of absolutely no answers. By 2015, the family tried to convince the Ministry of Public Security to assign Marilyn's case to the Quebec Provincial Police or the Montreal Police. They said that they knew that the Quebec City Police tried their best, but due to the complexity of the case, it should be turned to a national force who could also investigate in Montreal. They wanted to put more effort into investigating this area because that is where she lived for more than three years before coming home. This is where she was living living when she suddenly became terrified. This is where all her friends and acquaintances are from. Those people would have been very helpful in finding Marilyn and knowing what happened because they might know a lot more than what the family knows 
about what led up to her sudden change in personality. But despite having a very strong reason and a strong case to move her case to a more national force, these requests were denied. The family was starting to get more and more frustrated with the Quebec City Police because basically this entire time over the course of a decade, they investigated the disappearance as a runaway or a suicide without much consideration into the possibility of foul play. They think that if police took her disappearance more seriously from the very beginning and looked at it from all angles, that she may have been found. But the media started talking on her case and making it known that the Quebec City police weren't doing their due diligence for Marilyn. Police weren't happy about this newfound pressure on them though, so police came out with a statement saying that they had worked hard to find Marilyn from the very beginning and that they appreciate any help that they can get. Now, I don't know a lot about Canadian police or politics or how much of that works, but I will say that in a lot of cases, there is obvious a neglect of duty by the police but I don't think that that's totally the case here. I do think that they tried at first and I do think that they took it seriously, but I do think that they were too focused on this one possibility of her just running away and taking her own life that they got tunnel vision and didn't really consider looking into any other avenues. And then once they just kept hitting all of these dead ends, it just feels like they stopped caring and they pretty much gave up on the investigation. It seemed like they couldn't get anything from this one specific theory and instead of looking into other avenues, they just sort of gave up and focused their energies elsewhere. By 2017, the family hired a very well-known and respected lawyer, Mark Bellamere, and they also raised the reward money from $10,000 to $30,000. They were hoping that this would motivate more witnesses to come forward with what they know. They also announced that they were setting up a tip line for people to come forward anonymously. The family understood that people may not want to come forward to speak with police because because of course, they might have their own self-interests in mind. They may be hiding something from police that's completely unrelated to Marilyn's disappearance that they just don't want police finding out. So by contacting Marilyn's parents directly, they are able to hide their identities while putting forth valuable information that can lead to finding Marilyn. All her family wanted and all they still want is to find Marilyn. After 10 years of not knowing what happened to their beautiful daughter, that is all they cared about. They made it clear that any amount of detail, no matter how big or small it may seem, can be exactly what the investigation needed, and that is still true to this day. The family also went to the public to plea for their daughter. Andre said, quote, Marilyn, if you're still alive, for us, it's like yesterday you disappeared. We love you. We're waiting for you with open arms and we miss you so much. After this big press conference and setting up the tip line, the family announced that there now have been 43 total sightings of Marilyn since she was last seen in 2008. This is also when the family found out about Marilyn's strange demeanor back in late 2007 when Jonathan and her went to this party. This confirmed that she truly was going through something very difficult before she disappeared. Not only her family noticed it, but many of her friends noticed it as well. But the 43 sightings also gave them hope that maybe, even nine years after her disappearance, maybe she was still out there and she was still alive. But after this, I couldn't find any further information. The last article I saw about this case was from around 2017, so not much information has come out about her disappearance after that. And that's why I wanted to cover her case to begin with. I wanted to put her case back out there. I wanted to remind you all of her story and put her picture and her face out there. At this point, Marilyn would be 38 years old. So of course, with this case, there are a few theories as to what may have happened to Marilyn. The first theory, which is the theory that police have been going off of for the majority of the investigation, is that Marilyn died by suicide. So of course, the largest, most prominent theme in this case is Marilyn's mental state. She was clearly declining in her mental health in the months before her disappearance. That's no secret. Many, many people who knew her saw these very clear signs that something horrible had happened to her. Now, we can speculate about what happened to her, but I don't personally think that that's totally useful. She clearly didn't want anybody to know. It's not something that she was comfortable talking about at all, so I'm just gonna leave it at that. Something horrific happened to her. 
and that's all that matters. But because of what happened to her, it's clear that she was going through some very difficult things. It could be possible that she just had such a bad mental breakdown that she just couldn't handle it any longer. Even with this, we can speculate whether she had an underlying personality or mental disorder. Maybe it was schizophrenia and she just suddenly started showing symptoms. We know that a lot of people with the gene for schizophrenia may not start showing signs until something really big happens, a big life event, whether it be positive or negative. And in this case, it would be very negative. A big thing that happened to Marilyn that was traumatic that brought forth this mental health disorder. Maybe she had bipolar disorder, which also has features of paranoia. There's even a subset of depressive symptoms that do include paranoia. So it could be possible that she was just declining in mental health already. She had anxiety or depression or whatever it may have been and that this event caused it to just accelerate and get even worse. But I do want to mention that she had absolutely no prior history of any sort of mental health issues before the winter of 2007. So she may not have had any sort of underlying mental health condition. I think it's perfectly reasonable that she was in a depressed and anxious state as a direct result of her trauma, which is 100% normal and it's not always because of some underlying mental health reason. If you go through something absolutely horrible, even if you are the most resilient, strongest, mentally healthy person on this planet earth, you're going to go through a period of being depressed and anxious and angry and just wanting to isolate yourself and just wanting to explain what happened but not knowing how and not knowing how to explain it to yourself or anybody else. This can be very isolating, it can be very depressing, and it can just put you in such a bad mental state. Just because someone doesn't have a diagnosed mental health condition doesn't mean that they can experience symptoms of one after something traumatic happens to them. So again, the mental health thing is not something that I want to talk about much further because she clearly was struggling, whether she had a diagnosed condition or not. The specifics of any sort of disorder don't necessarily make a huge difference in this case. She was struggling and we can just leave it at that. So what we do know is that when she was seen at the ATM, she was looking very worried. She was trying to take money out for whatever reason. It could have possibly been that she didn't want to use her credit card so that she couldn't be traced. If she didn't want anybody to know where she was going, she would have needed cash to avoid anybody tracing her. But she couldn't, so she used her card for coffee. Now, I do wonder if she got any sort of cash back from that. I wonder if police asked the barista or if that was brought up at all. Or you can even see on her bank statements if this one cup of coffee was like $65, that would show that, you know, the coffee was probably $5 and she asked for $60 in cash back. I just wonder because she didn't use her card at all after the coffee shop, so she would have had to figure out some way to get places and buy things and spend money without being traced. Or we can think that maybe she just had cash on her that she used for the rest of the time. We know that she traveled over 10 miles to this coffee shop, but it was five hours after she was seen at the ATM. I don't want to say she walked this far because it was freezing cold out and it just doesn't seem that reasonable. I don't know why someone would walk that far but it was five hours. So given how long that it took her to get there, maybe she for some reason decided to walk all that way or maybe she hitched a ride with someone for free and was standing on the side of the road for a while before someone was able to pick her up and that's why it took so long. Or maybe she had to find a taxi and had to convince the driver that she was gonna pay in cash instead of a card. A lot of times they want your card beforehand to know that you're not just gonna get out of the taxi and run off. Or of course, maybe she had gotten a ride from someone Somebody that she knew and they just haven't come forward with that information. But either way, I do think that it's most likely that she got a ride from somebody, no matter the means of getting that ride. Then we have the sightings of her in Hawkesbury, hours away from where she was last seen. At that point, she clearly got a ride from somebody or hopped a train or something. There's no way she would have walked all that way. Now, when it comes to people seeing her in Hawkesbury, obviously it's never been 100% confirmed that it was was her because it's just witnesses. It could have been someone that looks like her, but 
I do personally kind of lean towards believing this theory because of how many people say that they saw her and have the same consistent story. To me, that just doesn't seem like a coincidence. She looked very unique. She had short hair. She had this style about her that was very unique. So I just don't see how she would have gotten mixed up with somebody by so many people. So with this theory, maybe she had a mental break and then she just thought that she needed to escape for a while and maybe when she was out there she realized that she just wasn't getting better so she took her life somewhere in that town and that's why she had just never been found. Police probably didn't spend too much time searching outside of Quebec which probably means that if she did take her own life out there that they wouldn't have found her body. If we don't believe the sightings of her in Hawkesbury we can theorize that she took her life while in the state of a mental break shortly after she was seen at the coffee shop. And again for some reason, she just hadn't been found. Now, like I mentioned earlier, there is this very long river along the road that it takes to get to Hawkesbury. So I think that if she ended up in that river, it's possible and probable that she wouldn't have been found. If her body was picked up and brought miles and miles away, it's possible that her body was nowhere near Quebec City. Depending on which theory is true, the fact that she was in such a big hurry at the coffee shop kind of does point to this theory. If she was really just trying to get out of there as fast as possible, she could have been very anxious and worried about what was gonna happen, if someone would see her, if someone would recognize her. The biggest things pointing towards this theory, of course, are the behaviors that she showed leading up to her disappearance. But to me, the sightings of her in Hawkesbury really make me question this theory. I am more inclined to believe that she would have taken her life in the midst of a mental break rather than a year later after she escaped the situation. Or maybe all of this has something more to do with the man that she was seen with and we just don't know because we don't know who this man is. I don't really know. I personally think that this theory would seem a lot more likely if she wasn't spotted in that town so far away so long after her disappearance. So that brings me to the theory, which is the one that her family believes, which is that something bad happened to her. Again, going off of what we said before, it's very clear that something bad happened to her. I really wish that the person that she was talking to at the party would come forward and tell us what they were talking about because that that can give us a lot of information about what she was going through. Either way, I think that Marilyn believed that she was in immediate danger. And given her behaviors and given how anxious and paranoid she was, I believed that whatever happened to her was not just an isolated incident, but ongoing. I think it's possible that whoever hurt her was stalking her and maybe threatening her. She was crying and felt hopeless for months. Now, I understand that having something horrific happen to you can make you incredibly sad and scared and hopeless, but I don't necessarily know if I think that it would make someone want to up and leave their life as they knew it and move away as soon as they could. That right there is a huge red flag that someone may have been following her or threatening her or making her feel very unsafe in her own apartment. As far as I knew, she lived alone in that apartment and that can be incredibly scary for somebody who is being threatened or followed. That is what can make someone completely spin out of control and feel that they have absolutely no control over their life, especially if she reached out for help from the authorities and was denied or if she reached out to friends for help and she wasn't taken seriously. That happens a lot where women will say that they are being stalked or that they are scared for their life or that somebody is threatening them and just nobody believes them and nobody takes them seriously. That can make someone feel so incredibly alone and hopeless. If she had told a couple of close friends what happened to her and nobody believed her or didn't take it seriously, that would make it so she wouldn't want to tell anybody else. Or if she was in immediate danger, she could have felt just completely unable to tell anybody out of fear that they were going to come after them. She mentioned to her mom once that when she was back home and was feeling completely safe, that that's when she would tell her what happened. That's another giant red flag. 
This tells me that she needed to feel completely safe and completely removed from the situation before she felt comfortable telling somebody. This also makes me wonder if the person who had harmed her was somehow involved in her friend group. If it was someone that a lot of her friends knew and they trusted and then she was suddenly coming out and saying that this person harmed her, the friends could have not believed her because of that. Maybe they were hearing another story from another mutual friend that, you know, this didn't really happen and that Marilyn was lying and maybe the friends were having to take sides. I don't really know, but even just this one idea makes me wonder if maybe she was talking to that friend and the friend had mentioned that that person was at the party and she got very upset and just wanted to leave because she didn't want to be around the person who harmed her. I don't really know. I'm just kind of speculating, but I do think that that could be possible. I know that that happens a lot where if one friend harms another and she's coming out and telling everybody what happened, a lot of times friends don't believe the girl or the victim because they know the other person and they think, oh, my friend would never hurt somebody and they would never do that to somebody. And again, that can make someone feel completely isolated and alone and it would make someone want to leave the situation. That would make someone want to leave all of their friends behind and not say a word to them. Now, going back to her being stalked or threatened, even Jonathan got the vibe that she didn't want to tell him because she didn't want to put him in danger by telling him. That is a pretty big tell. So now let's go back to the ATM. She looked paranoid. She was looking to one side. Maybe the person caught up with her and forced her to go to the ATM. Maybe they told her to take out however much money that she could, and maybe she knew that she just didn't have a lot of money, so she tried to take out as much as she could, taking out $60, but even that was declined, so she knew that she couldn't get anything out. And maybe that made her terrified, like they would hurt her if she didn't give them money. I don't know. And then when it comes to the coffee shop, maybe she had convinced this person to let her go to the coffee shop to get something to drink, and maybe she had planned on going in there and telling somebody what was happening, but she didn't at the last second because she was really scared. It does make me wonder what can possibly be worse than being raped or witnessing a murder. The only thing that I can think of is that if somebody hurts you and then stalks you and threatens you and makes you live your life in constant fear, if someone had hurt her and they said, look at what I did to you once, I can do more, I can hurt you again, and I can kill you if I want to, that is absolutely terrifying. And maybe they were making violent threats against her and her family. That's also something that I can see it being worse than being harmed yourself. If I was in a situation where someone said that they were either going to harm me or my family, my friends, or even my dog or anybody close to me, I would rather them hurt me than lay a finger on anybody else that I cared about especially my dog. I would say that somebody going out of their way to hurt somebody I loved is worse than hurting me. So if someone was saying that I will hurt your family just like I hurt you, or if you don't do this, then I'm going to kill your family, that can be what was worse than what happened to her. And that can also be the reason, again, why she didn't want to tell anybody because she didn't want to put them in danger. But with this theory, I don't really know where all of these sightings of her in Hawkesbury really fit in. I do think that there are way too too many sightings of her to be a coincidence, but I don't know. Maybe she just has a very convincing doppelganger. That could be possible. But then I also want to say, like, if there was a picture of somebody that looked like me on the news and the family was coming out and saying that they saw the victim in the town that I lived in, knowing that the person looks like me, I would come forward to make sure that people weren't actually seeing me. You know what I'm saying? Like, if I knew that that person looked like me and the family thought that that person was the missing victim, I would come forward and be like, hey, I kind of look like her. Are you sure it's not me? And then they could say, oh, no, like we know that it wasn't you, or they could ask the people who saw her and say, is you know this really the person you saw? And they can confirm or deny. But I feel like if it really was her, she wouldn't have come forward to let people know that it was her. So that kind of makes me think that maybe it really was her, but we can't assume that somebody in that small town would just happen to see her. I mean, we do know that it was a small town, but it's possible that this person just didn't pay attention to the news, didn't read the newspaper, just missed it somehow. 
but if it really was her, maybe she was in that town being held against her will. Or maybe she had actually escaped this person and was hiding there, hence her trying to take out cash so nobody could trace her, and the reason that she looked paranoid at the ATM because she just didn't want to be seen. Maybe she was in such a rush at this coffee place because she just didn't want this person to catch up with her. Then maybe she escaped and made it to that town somehow and then was hiding out there for a really long time, but then this person eventually caught up with her and harmed her because they had been following her the entire time. I think that that's totally possible. So the last theory is that Marilyn left on her own accord and is still out there living her life off the grid. This is another theory that the family believes and is obviously the one that they are hoping is most true. In fact, the family said that they will not talk about Marilyn in the past tense until they know exactly what happened to her because to them, she's still alive. Now, there are a lot of signs pointing towards this. Again, we know that her mental health was declining and something caused her to want to abruptly leave Montreal. Maybe whatever or whoever it was knew that she had family in Quebec City, so once she got there, she realized that being home with her family was not safe for her or her family. So she decided to leave without telling her family where she was going for their own safety and hasn't reached out to anybody again because of their own safety. I do think that this seems like a very, very likely scenario to me. So first we know that she was seen leaving the home without her backpack, but then was seen on the ATM footage with that little black backpack. Clearly, she was hiding that backpack somewhere and didn't want her family to see it for whatever reason. Maybe she had cash in it and that is how she made it all the way to Hawkesbury without using her card again. Maybe she had some sort of burner phone in it and that's how she contacted people to help her get there and hang out with her there and stay with her without anyone seeing it on her phone records. We know that when she was at the ATM, she was looking back at somebody or something, so it could have been whoever was with her driving her south. Even if she did have money in this backpack, she could have been like, I don't want all this money in my account to go to waste. Let me just try to take it out just to have a little bit of extra cash and then it didn't work. So she just decided to leave it alone. Now I have seen some people say that because she didn't look very happy at the ATM that it's not probable that she left her own life because she would have been happy and excited to leave her life. But I don't think that that's necessarily true. I think that if she was leaving out of necessity and not necessarily out of choice, that she probably would have been stressed and upset about it. She probably didn't want to leave her family, but if she felt like she had to, she would have been very stressed and upset and was sad that she was leaving her family with no answers, but in her head, she knew that it's what was best for them. Maybe the young man she was seen with is just somebody that she knew and he agreed to help her start her new life. We know that when she was seen at the coffee shop, she was headed away from the direction of her family home. Then obviously, if these sightings are true, she was seen in a town south of Quebec City, which the coffee shop is on the way to get to that town. So this at least shows that no matter the reason, she was in fact traveling in that direction. Whether that was really her in the town or not, we know for a fact that she had been traveling in that direction. Now, after these initial sightings in Hawkesbury, she was not seen again. So that can mean a few things. Again, in the other theory, we said that it's possible that she took her own life after being there. It's possible that somebody caught up with her after finding out that she was there. But I think that it's possible that she learned about people seeing her there, so she left. Maybe somebody in the town tipped her off that, hey, people are noticing you, or maybe she just realized that people noticed her. Maybe she saw the cops looking for her. Maybe she saw the newspaper that the journalist wrote about her being there, so she left. Maybe after realizing that people were starting to recognize her, she left the town where nobody would recognize her and then realized that she needed to change her appearance. So after she made it to the new town and completely changed her appearance, of course, nobody in Hawkesbury is gonna see her again because she left. I think that if she was trying really hard to stay hidden, that that is very possible and likely. It definitely makes sense that if you start getting the idea that people are recognizing you when you don't wanna be recognized, that you wanna leave as soon as you possibly can and change your appearance to the point where nobody knows who you are. So 
Those are basically the main theories in this case. After talking each one through, I do kind of lean most towards her leaving and starting a new life. I think that if we put all of the evidence together, it's what makes the most sense and leaves the least amount of questions unanswered. Her leaving because she knew her friends and family weren't in danger makes perfect sense. It makes sense why she was seen in a hurry at the ATM, why she was looking anxious and ready to leave. It makes sense why she was in a rush at the coffee shop then not being seen again until all of these sightings in Hawkesbury were coming out makes sense if she left town and went there. All of this completely makes sense for this theory. If she changed her appearance and is working and making money and living off of the grid, it's very possible that she's still out there. She could have been in so much danger that even now, 13 years later, she's still afraid of putting her family in danger and that's why she hasn't let anybody know where she is or what she's doing. It makes sense that she would want everybody to think that maybe she's deceased or just gone if she really was in so much danger. It's probably safer for her if her attacker thinks that she's deceased. The only thing that doesn't really make sense to me with this is why she wouldn't have reached out to her family to let them know that she's okay. She could have written an encrypted letter, not even put her name on it, but just put tidbits of information in there that only they would know and then just not put a return address on it and and tell them that she wants to stay hidden. She wouldn't even need to tell them where she is or what she's doing. She literally could have written it and just put a sentence that, you know, they know that only she would say just so that they know that she was okay. That really is the one thing that just doesn't make sense to me with this theory. I do just feel like she would want her family to know that she's okay, especially with how desperate they are to find her. But again, we don't know her situation. We don't know if she's able to reach out or if she's tried to and has just failed. So we really can't say for sure. I really wish we knew more about what was going on in her life. If more people would come forward with information about about what she said before her disappearance, this case truly could be solved. And I do think that this truly will be a case that is eventually solved. It's never too late for a case to be solved and it only takes one person coming forward with information. So again, that is why I'm making this video. I want to make sure as many people as possible hear her story and see her face. If you think you saw her, please come forward with that information. Even if you live in the US or another country, leaving the country to come to the US is a huge possibility for her. So even if you're not in Canada, just keep on the lookout for her and share her story wherever you can. This case needs eyes and brains. This really can be solved. We can find the answers. We just need the right person to see this video, read an article, or to see her picture. Marilyn, if you happen to see this video, just know that your family cares so much about you. They just want to know that you're safe, and even if you don't want to come home, they just need to know that you're okay. They understand that you went through something absolutely horrific and unspeakable, but they just want to know that you are okay. Marilyn Bergeon is five foot seven inches and weighed 115 pounds at the time of her disappearance. She has brown hair and green eyes. She has a tattoo of a pegasus just below her right collarbone. She would be 38 years old this year. If you have absolutely any information, please contact Mark Bellamere at 418-681-1227 or toll free at 1-800-840-1526. So, that is all I have for today's video, and now I want to hear your guys' thoughts. Do you think that something happened to Marilyn so bad that caused her to want to take her own life? Do you think she's out there alive and just living her life off the grid, or do you think that somebody harmed her? Please let me know your thoughts and theories in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every week. Don't forget to turn on the notification bell so you don't miss any of my future videos. Don't forget to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe and stay healthy. And I hope to see you next time. Bye.